<laughs> okay, so welcome everybody. We have Hugh Jones today from our neighborhood at Imperial, and he will talk about scattering and bound states of bottomless potentials. So you go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, so I guess I should get in my apology at the beginning to the extent that this isn't a great deal about PT symmetry. There is some, some stuff at the end, which I, I, can, I can bring at the end, but by and large, it is not actually about PT symmetry. What it is about is, is um, the exponential potential and kind of funny properties of the exponential potential and various bits and pieces of it. If you break up the exponential potential by sticking in mod modulus of X all over the place, you get actually um, six different related potentials. And um, the, this whole story started with um, this first one here, the, the v, what I call V1, um, and that was the subject of a paper by Ahmed and, and people. Uh, and they, they picked out, they, they were talking about scattering states of this potential, and they picked out some very special discrete set of states, which they claim were BIC, that's bound states in the continuum. Um, but it turns out that they're not. And, I, and actually those, those special states are actually related to another um, potential, uh, exponential potential, namely V2. And so that's, and then you can spell out all these relationships. In fact, you can go on and get all kinds of relationships between these different uh, potentials. Some are barriers, some are um, wells, uh, some, are, some, are, some, are, some, are, some are bottomless, and that's kind of interesting. Bottomless potential are kind of really weird. So that's the, the story. So first of all, like this, this first section, is to do with this paper by Ahmed I, I, and relations with that. Then I go on to consider the, ups, the negative of all those potentials, the upside down ones. And then I give a summary about exponential potentials. Then I go on the, the sort of things that I've been doing. You can um, then talk about power potentials, bottomless power potentials, such as X cubed and minus X to the fourth. And I give a summary then but if there's time and if people are interested, I can go on and, and talk a little bit about um, what, what bound states in the continuum really are. Okay, so to start with, I'm, I'm talking about this particular potential, which, which is a bottomless well. <clears throat> and that's the potential that was dealt with in this paper by Ahmed et al. And um, so this, this is a, this case, this, um, this Schrodinger occasion can be solved um, analytically in terms of Bessel functions. So everything is explicit, which is quite, which is quite nice. So the Schrodinger equation is, here, sorry, is uh, written down here. Uh, and if you take a change of variables um, to Z equals, uh, unfortunately this, this now, this top line of my screen is underneath something else with people entering, I'll get rid of that, okay. <laughs> Changing, change, making this change of variables, then it becomes a Bessel equation. And the solutions to the Bessel equations are uh, Bessel's J plus or minus nu, where nu is kappa A. Okay, and kappa is related to the, um, the energy <clears throat> Q and yeah. So those are the solutions, but of course we have to admit these are scattering solutions essentially. But we have to make we have to apply the boundary conditions, which are that um, because the potential is um, is not analytic, it changes at x equals zero. So we have to apply boundary conditions at x equals zero, namely psi prime must be continuous. Psi, psi of course must be continuous, but also psi primed. So the acceptable solutions to this um, equation are they can be you can take them to be even or odd. The even ones are like this. Um, so QA is the value of Z when X equals zero. <clears throat> so this, this, the, this is an even state. It's, it's even um, and, and uh, satisfies psi, because it psi, it satisfies psi primed is equal to zero at the, at the origin. And the odd one, um, 
satisfies it's actually zero at the origin. So that, that's an odd thing when you put in this sign uh, function here as well. So those are the actual explicit solutions. They're, they, they're, they are real, as you see, they're just in terms of J, which is a real argument and a real uh, index. So they're, they're real. So there's actually no probability current. Uh, and, they're, and also they're, they're square integral, which is rather amazing. So these Bessel functions are actually square integrable. So, which is very, really rather strange. Like you think classically, if you've got a, a bottomless potential, you think that the wave function just run away and kind of blow up at infinity, but no. Oh, but, but you, the time to go to infinity is finite. So it's like in a finite box. Okay. Okay, well, okay. it was surprising to me, but if it's not surprising to you, that's fine. <laughs> um, so these are the, um, sorry, where I've got to, yeah. So, but how, so these are real, they, they don't have any probability of current. So you can think of them as kind of being very, very weird bound states because they are integrable. So, but you can get scattering states by taking the appropriate linear con combinations because the, the analog of e to the plus and minus i x are, are these the Hankel functions h1 and h2 and the main point of this the original paper by Ahmed which is the starting point of all this was that there are some particular discrete values of nu the index nu which is related to the energy e where the solution is purely j nu not not j nu and j minus nu but just purely j nu or purely j minus nu uh, and they, um, Ahmed and Co, thought that this was very significant. Some strange noise going on. Um, so, if if you want pure J nu, which they did, they they occur when, in in two cases, if you're talking about psi even, they occur when. J primed nu when the derivative of J at QA is zero, and they, for the odd case, they occur when the Bessel function itself vanishes. And this, this is a graph. This is so we're looking for zeros of J nu QA and J prime nu QA, and this is a graph uh, for a particular case when the the um, size of the potential V naught is fifty and but that must be a equals one, not zero. Sorry about that. A is one. Um, so there we are. You've got a graph of them, and there's a zero here. You see on, on J nu, there's another zero here. There's a zero of J prime. There's another zero of J prime here. So the two lower states are, are, um, are this one, are, are this zero and that zero, and this is what the the wave functions look like. Um, so you can see that. They fall off. Well, I'll, I'll say in a minute how they fall off. Uh, this, this is the even one. It looks perfectly normal because the big feature about these bottomless potentials is that they oscillate more and more rapidly as you get to large x. So this is the even one, and this is the odd one, the lowest even state. So in the, in Ahmed's paper, they um, they called them bound states in the continuum. So bound states in the continuum, basically speaking, are um, if you've got scattering states, if you're above the potential, you would normally just expect scattering states, so states that go off to infinity. But um, bound state in the continuum is where you have something which falls off exponentially, even though energetically it could go off to infinity. But in fact, these these particular states, these this, this um, these discrete set of states are they're no more bound than any of the other states they just have the same uh, exact asymptotic behavior which in fact is given by the large z behavior of of the Bessel function which is so here you see that here's a co cosine and remember z is is actually an exponential of x mod x so that's that's oscillating very rapidly more and more rapidly and this is the actual fall off and z so that's actually an exponential fall off of the of the of the amplitude. So the question is: so Hugh, can I can I ask a, just a short question? Yeah. I mean, your your um your states that are going off your your eigenfunctions are square integrable. Yeah. And that's because there there is this fast enough algebraic falloff. Yeah. 
Yeah. But for example, if you wanted to calculate the expectation value of your Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. does that exist? Um, let me come back to you on that because it's true that you're absolutely right. I guess it doesn't probably. Or at least of course not. I mean, I think that's 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 what bothers me about calling them bound states. Okay, I called I called them. I'm not calling them bound states. I call no, them. No, no, no. I understand. I yeah. call them bound states in a in a in inverted commas. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in fact, in fact, what I, I, you're anticipating, what I'll say in a minute, which is that the the um, the expectation values of moments of x are finite, but when you bring down when you're talking about p moments of the momentum, they the, the, I think the first moment is okay because it's odd anyway, but the p squared di uh, diverges, which is what you just said. So that all applies to the Hamiltonian. Yeah, but if if I may add to what Carl just said, it's true that the powers of h uh, it doesn't make sense; they don't exist. The expectation value, but the exponential e of e to the minus i h t does exist. It is well defined in such cases, and you can define and you can get a well defined evolution time evolution kernel um, for for such models. Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so so the question I'm asking is what what are these special these special states that they picked out? What what are they all about? Um, what makes them so special? Well, in fact, um, so, somebody this uh, a guy called Biswanath Rath who who makes a a business of going through old papers and trying to find mistakes in them. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, found a mistake. Well, he didn't find a mistake. He found, noticed something strange about these those states namely and he did it numerically he said no they're not the eigenstates of this um, upside down this bottomless potential they're actually the energy levels of the related um well which is th this one this is another bit of the uh, exponential potential and he said no they're actually they're, they're actually bound states of this of this potential so let's have a look at that that potential that's that's the potential Okay, which is related to, to V1 just by changing signs of, in the exponential. And the bound states of, of that potential are, in fact, sorry, are given by like that. So, in fact, the, the, the bound states of that potential are precisely given by when, when J primed is zero or J nu is zero. So the, the point is that in, in this case, when we change to this potential from the previous one, V1, Z, instead of being QA e to the plus mod X over A is now QA e to the minus mod X over A. So when the large X behave, mod X behavior of this potential is, is now the small Z behavior of the J nu's. So namely J nu is given by that. So if you're talking about the potential, this potential well, instead of the, the, the um, barrier, then as I said, you're, you're concerned with this small Z behavior, J nu, and you see, and it was either J nu or J minus nu. Well, you see J nu is okay, um, because that goes with small Z, small Z, but the J minus nu is not because this is a negative and it blows up. So in fact, precisely, for, to have bound states of this potential, you need only J nu, you must not have J minus nu. So in other words, that, that's why J minus nu doesn't work. And that's why those, um, those states are, are single. That, that's what that connection is, namely that those special states that he picked out, which he thought were bound states in the continuum are actually energy levels of, the, of this, this potential V2. Okay, is that, is that clear to everybody? Hope. So, um, okay, so got... Hugh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's not clear to me. I thought you'd shown that the those states were eigenstates of the original potential. They were like those scattering states, not bound states. Ah, okay. So okay. they're they, they just some particulars. Uh, as far as the the the, the barrier is concerned, there's just some particular. Um, scattering states that um, that Ahmed and Co picked out for some reason, but in fact, may, may also ask a question, well, similar to the questions which have been already asked. If you have a bottomless potential which uh, falls down so rapidly, yeah. then uh, classically there is blow up 
the solution reached the infinity at finite time. Okay. And then I would expect that the quantum problem is not well posed. It's like falling on the center. So uh, the Hamiltonian not only doesn't have a bottom, but also unitarity is violated. So uh, can you comment about that, please? <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, all I can do is, is present the solutions. These are solutions. And um, I thought they were very strange, and they are indeed. You're saying they are strange, and in fact, you're saying that there's not a kind of well-defined problem, which may be okay. That, that's all my comment. Well, okay, so I will continue to listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hugh, what, Hugh, what is happening with your Schrödinger equation if you change for, uh, the sign of small a in in the exponent of Okay. If you change, uh, okay. Well, changing small a is um, is basically covered in all the all the different. There are six different potentials altogether, and I, I'm changing. I'm I'm physically changing the sign in front, like here minus. I, I changed from minus plus to minus, but that's equivalent to changing the sign of a. So in fact, yeah, this is why I say um, you do not change the modulus, but you should change the sign of a. And so what's going on in your Schrodinger equation if you change sine of A? Well, I, I just showed you the, the um, I, I said here that, um, wait a minute. Where was the Schrodinger? The Schrodinger equation is there. So the, all that happens when you change the Schrodinger equation, you change this, this potential. It either goes to plus or minus, that's all, okay? Which I was doing by hand, which is equivalent to changing um, the sine of a. Yeah. Right. No, where are we? Um, okay. Now, so those were two kind of non-analytic bits of the exponential potential, which I call v three, and. This the analytic potential, the exponential potential is equivalent to the v2. It's got a this is the barrier on the left hand side, and it's the um well on the right hand side, and this is dotted bit. So the, the v2 was was this one, and the v1 was, was this bit. So if you put them both things together, then you get these um so-called states, which are bound state, normal bound states on the right, but then they've got this funny uh, rapidly varying thing on the left hand side okay yeah so that's uh, that's the whole the whole explanation so v v v not v1 v2 v3 but this looks very much like the iri potential or the linear potential with the iri function no uh, okay well i'll come to uh, a little bit of that i'll come to that later on when i talk about power potentials it's true that the power potential have similar type of behavior yes Yes, <clears throat> it just depends. The, the, the fall off will, will be different. And in fact, the, the airy functions, they don't fall off rapidly enough to be even convergent. Um, so those are sort of called bound states in the, of the bottomless potential in the sense that they occur at different energy, distinct energies are the normalizable. Uh, however, they have infinitely many nodes on the left as we um, noticed. And in response to what people have been asking, it's true that all moments x to the n are finite, but the moments with respect to p are not, because each derivative d by dx brings down a factor of, of, of an, it cancels out the, uh, of, it gives an exponential increase on the left hand side here. <clears throat> so now let me, let's have a look at these um, scattering coefficients of the original. Um, bottomless barrier v1, and that will give us a bit for more insight into the, what these special values uh, of e are about. And moreover, there's a further connection between the of these scattering states into the with the bound states of the related potential well, this potential well, which is a different well, which is minus v1. So you just turn v4 v1 upside down. Then you've got an infinite potential well, and you can get at the eigen, the bound state eigenvalues of V4 through looking at scattering states of V1. 
So we're talking about scattering from V1. So we consider a wave on the, on the left, which is a, the combination of H1 and the, the Hankel functions, functions one and two, um, <clears throat> approaching the potential from the left. And of course, this is what we call a incoming and outgoing is to do with now Hankel functions rather than just plane waves. Uh, the asymptotic of, of behavior of Hankel functions is, is given here. So you've got an, an exponential. This is, again, this is rapid uh, um, oscillation in the fall off. So H2 represents the incoming wave, H1 reflects the, uh, uh, represents the reflective wave. On the right, it actually changes from the, the um, roles of H1 and H2 change, are interchanged because the, the argument on the right hand side is actually QAE to the plus X over A rather than QAE to the minus X over A because it's modulus. So uh, the flux actually um, is, is this because it's, it's, it's the run skin of, sorry, it's the run skin of, uh, it's the run skin of H1 star with H1, but H1 star is H2. So it's this run skin and that's actually something very simple. It just comes out to be a constant here. So you've got a constant flux on the right hand side and similarly on the left hand side. So you have to, it, uh, in order to calculate the scattering coefficients, you have to match psi right and psi left on the derivatives and you get these two equations. Uh, and there's, there's a short annotation I'm using now, which is when I write H1, I mean H1 at QA or Z naught and same with H1 prime, same with H2. Um, and the solutions are, these are the solutions. So the A, these, these are the coefficients on the left-hand side. Uh, are the, are the scattering coefficients are A and B are, are these expressions. Now, something nice happens at the, if you go to these special energies, which uh, Ahmed identified, something nice happens. Uh, and those are the energies when J nu of Z zero is equal to zero, or J prime nu is equal to zero. Well, when, because the relation between Hankel functions and Bessel functions, which is here, when, when J nu is zero, then H1 is equal to minus H2. And so A, this changes the sign. If you can write here H2 and change the sign. And then, you, then if you subtract B minus A, this, instead of being H1, H2 prime plus H2, H1 prime, it becomes H1, H2 prime minus H2, H1 prime, which is again the Ronskian and is very simple. So in fact, on those special energy, the, there's a very, very simple relationship between B and A, namely B minus A is equal to one. Uh, for the for the um, those states when J nu is equal to zero. For the states when J nu prime is equal to zero, um, it's actually very, very similar, except that it comes out B minus A is equal to minus one. Now, in fact, sorry, if you look at the expression for B, H, this is a real, because H2 is equal to H1 star, this is a real quantity. So B is actually pure imaginary. So at, at those special values, we have A is equal to plus B plus and minus one, i.e. plus and minus one plus IB. And of course, and then you can check that mod A squared is equal to one plus mod B squared. And that's consistent with unitarity because the transmission coefficient is one of a mod of one of A squared. And the reflection coefficient is mod B of A squared. Um, however, if, well, if pure J nu, if we're not talking about H, H nu, uh, the incoming one side on, uh, reflected and going into the other side, what we're actually talking about for those things, we've, we've got a pure J nu solution, which is a mixture of left and right moving waves. So if you're going to describe that situation, you need the transfer matrix, which takes into account incoming and outgoing on both sides. And you can, but you can get the transfer matrix from A and B, there are standard relations to, to give you the elements of the transfer matrix. And that gives you that the transfer matrix is, is as given here. And the important thing about that is that the eigen, an eigenvector of that transfer matrix is one, one. In other words, 
uh, an equal mixture of H1 and H2, which is actually J. So that just confirms <laughs> that uh, as those particular ones, J, J nu is, is, is connected by the transfer matrix on one side to the other and persist. Now, so that's one thing. The, the next thing is uh, the relation, as I said before, the relation to the bound states of V4, which is the upside down of the initial barrier, which is an infinite well. So if we go back to the expressions I showed you before for the scattering amplitudes and remember what the transmission coefficients and, and reflection uh, coefficients are. And they've always, they've always got the mod, one over a, mod a squared in the bottom. So you can have poles in, in, in these scattering amplitudes if when a is equal to zero in principle. But in fact, in the case when nu is real, there aren't any poles. There are no zeros of nu which is okay. However, and because there, there, there's, there's no, there's just, there's just there's no zero of it, that's all. But if we change Q to IQ and kappa to I kappa, which um, then the, the uh, Hankel functions go over to um, associated Bessel functions and they do have zero. Well, okay. And, and they do have zeros. So the reason the reason this is relevant to this potential is that that's precisely where I changed v to min, v naught to minus v naught, and the Schrödinger equation has got a minus sign here where it used to be plus before, and also the definition of kappa has changed. <clears throat> and and in that case, the independent solutions of that equation are, are uh, associated Bessel functions of i a of index i a kappa. And, but these have different asymptotic behaviors for large z. I blows up and so for a bound state we need psi just being pure k not i, no i. And the eigen, so the eigenvalues uh, of that potential are given by the zeros of, of k or k prime. And those are exactly where the poles occur for the scattering amplitude of V1 when you change V0 to minus V0. So just to repeat, if you, uh, th there, are, there are no poles of the scattering amplitude for V1 unless you change V0 to minus V0, which means you're basically going from the, the barrier to the well. And then the poles of those scattering amplitudes precisely give you the um, bound states of the potential row. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> okay. So that's that really. That's really uh, the the that really sums up the relationship of with the properties of V one and and the potentials that it's related to. But there are even more little bits of the the exponential potential which you can talk about, namely. Now I'm going to talk of V5, which I, which I call V5. So which is the upside. Remember, we had a potential which was like that and like that. This was V2. V5 is upside down of V2, which is now a finite um, barrier. And we've got a whole set of similar relationships from what I had before. So the bound states of V4 um, of, of that infinite Bar, uh, well, are they also related to special scattering states of V5, this one. So the same way, so in fact, you, you have this set of states. V5 has um, scattering states. There are special scattering states you can pick out, which are also the bound states of V4. And, and of course, both of these non-analytic potentials are, are segments of the, uh, the exponential potential. The, the turned turned upside down. So, <clears throat> if you let's let we know we know the story about you know these these non-analytic things by now, and so I can just go over to V six, which is the pure exponential potential, and and so you, which, where you get both bits of the wave function. So here we have on the left we've got a, a you know, part of a nice bound state um, wave function, and then on the right you've got this rapidly varying uh, wave function, which however 
does not fall off very fast because this is only a finite, um, it, it's not bottomless, it's got, a, it's got a bottom to it. And so that's the even one, that's the odd one. And finally, in the, the, again, you can take look at the scattering amplitude, you can change the sign of the potential and look for poles. And uh, let me not go through this. It's the same story though, you, you change, in one case, you change i's, then you change i's to j's, and you get eigenvalues of the other potential. So to summarize this whole section, uh, we've got these six different potentials, with, which, has got, which are interconnected. So the one we started one was v1, this bottomless well, no barrier. That had some special states, which uh, turned out to be the bound states of V2, and, and combining the two, they were sort of these famous, uh, in quotes, bound states of the exponential potential V3. Similarly here, and so you've got the, the, these two arrows, you've got that arrow there, and also you, you have this area here, which is where you have the poles of the scattering amplitudes give you this, the energies of this potential. Starting with, instead with V5, which is a finite barrier, special scattering states correspond to bound states of V4, and the poles of the scattering amplitudes can give you the bound states of V2. So actually, if, if you don't like bottomless potentials, this, this pair are a perfectly okay um, pair because this is a bottom, this is not, this has got a bottom, and this is a finite well. So these, these two are, are kosher. <laughs> okay. Um, any questions on, because I'm gonna go on to power potentials now. Any questions, more questions? I mean, I, I, I understand the comments that people have made that these are, these are very, very funny states of the bottomless potentials and maybe the whole thing is not mathematically um, viable, but that's what they are anyway. Okay. Uh, um, oh yeah, and I just wanted to say here that um, the difference was that the for the bottomless case they were normalizable normalizable wave functions, but the the um, momentum um, <clears throat> the moments of momentum were not um, in the case of these two um, v six, which is the upside the the, uh, the other exponential the um, the states are not actually even normalizable. I mean, they're scattering states on this side. They're definitely scattering states. All right, so that's the story of these different bits of, of um, exponential potential. So what about power potentials? I mean, somebody asked um, about the airy case with X. I, I won't discuss that because in order to get the wave functions even to be um, normalizable, you need to increase the power to at least uh, x cubed. So let's start with x cubed, if I can find it. Okay. So it certainly doesn't have conventional bound states. That's what we know about. And of course, that's the whole basic starting point of the whole of, of the considering i x cubed it's, itself. And the whole story of PT is basically starting with, with that. Um, but anyway, talking about x cubed itself, well, you, there are sort of these, you know, in quote bound states like those of, of the previous pot like exponential potential we're talking about. In this case, the, the three, there are three related potentials, which are these. So you've got X cubed, which is this one. You've got minus mod X cubed, which is this totally bottomless um, barrier. And then you've got mod X cubed, which is a infinite well. Um, and again, you, you can have the same sort of thing. So in other words, you can have some funny scattering states of this, um, bound states of that, and all combined in, in, in states of X cubed. And these, there they are. So there we are. So the, the so-called bound states that we've got here, it's a nice uh, exponential decay on the right-hand side and this rapid oscillation on the left-hand side, and same here, except this is odd, this is even, and this is odd. Now, in this case, we're talking about x cubed, the fall off um, on the left hand side uh, is actually proportional to one over mod x to the three quarters. So those wave functions are just barely convergent. 
that the moments of both x and p are divergent. So not much joy there. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that's, that's x cubed. What about minus x to the fourth, the famous minus x to the fourth? Well, in this case, the related potentials are um, the bottomless barrier, minus x to the fourth, uh, the infinite well, x to the fourth, and, and this thing, mod x, x cubed, which is, which is like that. And, um, so again, we have these are the so-called bound states of of the of this this final potential, which has got nice bound states on the right hand side, and these funny states on the left hand side. <clears throat> um, and in fact, that how this works is on the on the right hand side, the um, the wave function has to go to asymptotically to just a, a k Bessel function and no admixture of the i Bessel function because the i Bessel function has a wrong asymptotic behavior. In fact, these, these are the, the two solutions. Uh, if for, for large x, you can neglect um, and the, the energy actually and then just keep the potential. So these are the two solutions of that which are explicitly Bessel function. So, so that, was, that was just the ordinary minus x to the fourth. It wasn't, it wasn't the PT version of x to the fourth. It's a real minus x to the fourth. But um, as we all know, there is, a, there is the PT version of minus x to the fourth, which is a kosher potential. And it's, it's really x squared times ix to the epsilon continued from epsilon equals zero to epsilon equals two in the appropriate wedge, which for minus x to the fourth is, precise, is this wedge here. And the edge of the wedge lies precisely on, on the real axis. Now, as you as you will know, this this can be solved. Well, not solved, but you can show if, if you take a, a contour, the appropriate contour, which lies within the wedge as you go off to infinity, there is a transformation which can transform it into a, a proper <coughs> anharmonic oscillator and and shows that indeed um, the the eigenstates defined that way are perfectly not okay and perfectly kosher. So that, but you have to do that, you have to go on a complex plane. Um, but in fact, another way of, of getting at that, which was due to Ahmed, Bender and Berry, they showed that you could actually get the, the, at the bound state energies by looking again at the scattering states of the ordinary minus x to the fourth potential, which is the one I've been just been talking about. And, and, and using a different criterion about the scattering states. And in fact, that particular criterion was that at those energies, the potential is reflectionless. Um, that is to say, if you start on the left with an H1, you finish up with a H on the H1 or Zn on the right hand side, and similarly for H2. And th that is to say, the transfer matrix in that case has to be of the form e to the i phi or e to the minus i phi. It mustn't, mustn't mix up H1 and H2s. And so that's that's an interesting connection with the with the ordinary minus x to the fourth potential has this, um, this particular way of finding the eigenstates of, of the um, PT symmetric minus x to the fourth. Okay, so let's uh, make it a summary now of, of um, what we've learned so far. So uh, as far as the exponential potentials are concerned, um, I showed that the, the so-called BIC condition of Ahmed et al is actually a condition for a in quotes, bound state of the analytic exponential potential. The poles of the scattering amplitudes give bound states of exponential wells. The wave functions are normalizable even though potentials are both bottomless. Uh, well, I, I, I said they can be considered the static scattering states or unorthodox bound states. Um, so people may dispute that. Um, but anyway, in any case, the X moments are finite, but the P moments are not. That's about exponential potentials. About the power potentials, there's a similar story for X cubed and minus X to the fourth. The wave functions are normalizable. However, now both moments of X and P diverge. So it's not, it's not very healthy. Um, and this, that's a complete contrast, of course, with the, with 
Ix cubed with the Pt um, potentials Ix cubed and the Pt version of minus x to the fourth. Um, and the true, as I just said, the true bound states of, of the Pt minus x to the fourth are obtained by the reflectionless condition. Okay, so that's that's basically the summary of, of, of um, what I wanted to say. But um, since I've got a bit of time in hand, I will I will go on and just say a few words about BIC bound states in the continuum. Um, it seems that bound states in the continuum are not at all common in quantum mechanics. You've got to, you've got to construct extremely art, um, artificial potentials in order to, to get them. In fact, I looked, um, I, was in, I was curious, and um, the first paper on this is by von Neumann and Wigner back, back in 1929. And I was curious to have a look at it, <clears throat> just to practice my German because it's in German. And I, I believe it's wrong. I mean, this is a classic paper by two giants of, of physics, but I, I think they're actually wrong. Um, because what they said was they considered um, this was a radial potential. So they're talking about the, let's say, the you know, a, a central potential. Uh, and you and you were just talking about the radial um, Schrodinger equation. And with the with the radial potential of this one, two over r squared minus nine r to the fourth. So this is basically not a minus x to the fourth potential, except with a with an r squared bit at the uh, uh, you know this spike at the origin. And that potential, the that rate in the in the radial Schrodinger equation has an analytic solution which is just sine r cubed over r squared. So this again is one of these things which you know which goes, falls off and oscillates more and more rapidly as you go off to infinity. Um, so, okay, so, and they say that's a bound state in the continuum, but in order to be a bound state, so because it does fall off, it is really normal, normalizable, but in order to be a bound state in the continuum, that, that state would have to stand out and be different from the surrounding states. But in fact, this is only at E equals zero. If you go to any other value of E, there are just similar states. The, the, the asymptotic behavior of those states is completely similar. So E equals not is not a special state, it's not a BIC. So <laughs> I don't know if anybody, I mean, in the discussion, yeah. anybody else has, has actually read this paper or gone back to see it. Hugh, um, can I ask you a, a, a question again, similar to the previous thing I asked you? I mean, it, it, to think of it as a bound state, we would have to say, how much energy that bound state has, right? Yeah. Now you have, so so if you apply the Hamiltonian to it, you see something that looks like an eigenvalue. Yeah. But on the other hand, what happens if you take the expectation value of that state, of that, you know, of, of the Hamiltonian in that state? Do you get, it does, does that exist? I mean. No, probably not. Because, right. So, because, so wouldn't that wouldn't the condition for, you know, having a bound state, would be wouldn't it be that I can calculate? I mean, just naively that I can calculate the energy of that bound state using the Hamil using conventional quantum mechanical expectation values. Wouldn't yeah. wouldn't that? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. So, I mean, I I didn't invent this potential. No, um, no, no, no. Of course not. So. Um, I would say no. I agree with you. So it, it's they, these are um, eigenfunctions that satisfy the Schrödinger equation. But as I, I said before, the moments of uh, the, the moments of momentum generally diverge, and therefore you know p squared doesn't really exist. So yeah, it's just really weird. It's strange because yeah, very strange. So let's see how does that work. If you take the you've got p squared and then the potential, yeah, I guess p squared. I guess. Sorry, you. What is the expectation value of h in a scattering state? Scattering states are not, not normalizable. You cannot compute expectation value of h in a scattering state. Right, yeah. but this okay. would be a bound state. That's the hang point. On. Hang on. So the point is, I mean, normal scattering states, okay, uh, are are in potentials which are, which have got a bottom. So they, they don't go off to minus infinity. So you've got a bottom, and therefore um, the 
the, the states are they are not normalizable at infinity. You've got scattering states, uh, you know, just do not fall off exponentially. But in in the in the bottomless case, they do fall off uh, sufficiently, but they wiggle around so bloody much that 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 screws up the expectation. But I think, Carl, the answer must be that. In the in this in the Schrodinger equation, or in taking trying to take the expectation value, probably both p squared and the potential term both blow up, and they somehow magically manage to can, uh, uh, cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, okay. <clears throat> I mean, what is what is surprising to me? Maybe I was naive and I didn't know much about it. I would have thought that in the bottomless potential, the, the waveform would just just blow up at infinity, but that's not what happens. And, and I guess other people know, knew about that already. Anyway, this was this was so-called BIC, which you know in this famous paper by Wigner. Um, has anybody else read it? Actually, by the way. Yeah. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, but but in fact, such that. Um, Bound states in the continuum do exist, or the analogs of them do exist in photonics and um, and solid state physics, condensed matter physics. Um, and there's a nice example by Longy um, in the context of photonics. <clears throat> um, and uh, and, funny, and actually, it involves PT symmetry. So I, I'm, I am bringing in some references to PT symmetry after all. Um, so this is concerned with what this is is a if you consider that this is a sort of cross section of a, of a whole lot of waveguides, think of the waveguides going off, you know, into the into the screen or, or going off like that. A whole series of waveguides going in, in into the paper, um, which are which are all coupled together. And but this is, there are two special um, waveguides which which are which are different, which have some special additional couplings, which the other ones don't have. Namely, so this, as I said, this is a PT symmetric lattice of waveguides, which and they're all coupled evanescently. So a waveguides have a have a electric field which falls off exponentially. I, oh my God! I'm sorry, I've got to put my charge my. Okay. Um, sorry, I just had to put my charge on. Um, yeah, they're, they're they're coupled through the the details of the of the um, electromagnetic field. Which fall off exponentially, and they have. Um, but the special thing is that there is uh, gain and loss introduced at these two sites. So there's loss here at that site n equals minus one, and gain at n equals one, and equal and opposite. So PT. So the, 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 these things you have couple mode equations for each of the, the amplitudes in these different waveguides, which is which is this, um, and um, So sorry. So the the um, the cappers, uh, which are the um, sorry, was yeah. As far as the cappers are concerned, they're all um, the same. They're all the cappers are the same. Um, coupling to nearest neighbors, but the on-site potentials are, are are special. Are only exist on one and minus one. And the delta the real part plus IG and delta minus IG. <clears throat> and if you didn't have those defects, if you didn't have to put that delta and IG in it, then this, the solutions of, of those equations are easy. They're just psi n equals e to the i b to z. So b to z in the z direction, and then e to the minus i k n, which is on the transverse direction. And, and beta is um, given by 2 cross k. So beta, mod beta, is. is Less than or equal to two, so that's the that what that that is the range of the scattering solutions. So, but when you put this defect in, in other words, when you just have a special thing happening at sites one and minus one, well, you, again, you, you write psi n equals e to the i b to z times c n of q and look for solutions for c n and look for states where that falls off exponentially for large n. And you, you do this numerically and you find the following uh, as a function of G and 
um, beta, beta. So this, what's written in this, so from beta to minus two to two is the range of scattering states. There's a little blue line here, which you can just see, and that is a, a bound state. There is a bound state here, which is, however, not in the in the region of scattering. So that that's sort of kosher. That's that's normally allowed. But as you increase g, as you increase the gain and loss, first of all, this thing just disappears. It just isn't there anymore, and then it suddenly reappears at this point, and it reappears as, of course, a um, <clears throat> a uh, state in this complex conjugate. So we we start suddenly have here is a state with, with real part of the energy here inside the um, the scattering region, and and with um, also an, an exponent, a imaginary part plus or minus. So that is a, that is a, a real example of a bound state in the continuum. And then, and funny enough, it happens in a PT symmetric situation. Uh, okay, this is a particular value of delta. The blue line, as I said, the blue line is the real part, and the dashed lines represent the imaginary part. And uh, that's it. So if I could just summarize that, the, the, these bound states in the continuum, I think that you can easy, kind of quite easily produce them or they, they exist and they can be actually made experimentally in these um, optics and solid state situations, but um, they're much more difficult to do in, in pure quantum mechanics. Yeah, so there we are. That's, that's the summary. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Can I ask, first of all, I have to apologize for rendering late because I was in another administrative meeting, which <laughs> was not very exciting, but I'm glad I got the main topic of the talk. Uh, about the bound states, the definition I mean, one should give a mathematical definition, a strict definition of what a bound state is. First of all, it has to be a finite energy solution, right? I mean, otherwise, uh, otherwise, precisely, otherwise it's not a... So I think uh, what uh, Hugh said is correct. That's how the bound states in the scattering approaching because the P square, which are gradients from the point of view of quantum mechanics of Psi and the Ask, and the corresponding terms from the potential compensate each other and lead to a finite bound side energy. However, uh, in, uh, I mean, I think Andreas uh, commented on that, uh, if I'm right, about the scattering and, and scattering states, bound states. Of course, if you have asymptotic states, you cannot, I mean, usually the standard scattering requires asymptotic states, LZ formula or whatever. So there must be in this PT, and that's a question actually to the experts. Uh, what do you do with it? You don't have asymptotic states if the potential goes if the potential uh, goes down to to minus infinity in a sense. Am I right? In the presence of the potential is always there, in in some sense. All right, because eventually it will go up. <laughs> that that's how I understand it. I mean, you cannot define asymptotic states. You cannot define the LSN formula. No, no, because it's not. Uh, no, that's correct. I mean. That's how I understand not, that, why not, you get the bound states. Because it's the particles the bound state the system, in fact, that's the point. Sorry, because the particles are they're not free. They're not. They're they not are not free. free. That's exactly what I mean. Asymptotic states, yeah, like yeah. Uh, confined uh, quarks, they are not ever. I mean, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. about the asymptotic freedom, but I mean, it's yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. but in print, but you, the question is, um, um, uh, I mean, of course, if you have a potential which is in effect all the way out to infinity and the potential is getting stronger and stronger, then you don't have a simple discussion of LSC, but you can put an upside down potential like minus X to the four in a box. In a box, that's fine. But okay. in a box, and now you, have to, say, now you have to ask, you have to ask, have you completely destroyed that upside down um, bound state spectrum or not? I think you don't, but putting well, it in, in a box, fact, the, Putting this, it in a box this, is the correct way. Is the mathematical way that you should, you need to regularize the thing. That's the point. Right. Well, in fact, um, I've written a paper on this some time ago. I won't talk about it now. But, but in fact, you can uh, see the uh, PT symmetric 
spectrum of bound states, even if you cut off the potential inside of a box of size L, you know. Um, but but that, that requires some discussion. It's actually like an effective field theory. You put a cutoff in the states. If you put the thing in the box, you ignore states above a given cutoff, all right? And then you, you, you do renormalization in a sense. That's what you do by putting the system in a box, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, just a question to you uh, in association with the question of Carl. So if you put uh, minus x to the fourth in the box, then the, uh, it would be normal uh, quantum problem and the spectrum would be discrete. The mm -hmm. question, uh, whether the eigenstates of this problem would depend on the length of the box. I think they would. No. Sure. Yeah. Sure. No, no, no. In fact, oh. no. the PT symmetric states are very, very insensitive to the size. In fact, yes, the yes. effect of the size of the box is an exponentially small effect yes, that but, disappears. Yeah, right. But there should be a dependence. That's all I'm saying. That's, small. Uh, that's for a PT uh, for a pro problem formulation formulated in the PT sense on the wedge, not on the real axis. Mm. And if you just uh, have it on the real axis, mm. then uh, and if you put the box, then it's quite benign problem. But the spectrum would depend uh, crucially uh, on this regularization. Yes, Is but, my if you, impression correct? but if you put the box, effects. if you put the box where the wave function vanishes, I mean, there, I mean, it's not only vanishing algebraically in amplitude; it also also has a cosine. The WKB has also a cosine, so the cosine can vanish. And if you put the, the walls, <laughs> let's say, where, where the, and the nodes of the cosine, oh, yeah. then, you don't, then, then it's okay. Oh. Uh, so you, you have a family of boxes that you receive to infinity. Uh, there, there you get a well-defined problem. Yeah, but that would be a finite size scaling you would obtain. Yeah, but, the fi but you don't- No, no, I'm saying it's not a criticism. The way it's fine. That's what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's actually the correct way is that- No, no, the problem, the problem is that various energies will, uh, uh, cosines belonging to various energies will, will vanish at different positions. And that's right, yeah. But, uh, but then probably you can do something, uh, some, some witchcraft um, and- <laughs> could, I, could I just comment? I mean, the, what you're talking about is, is interesting, but it's not trivial. And that's because this is a double scaling problem. In one hand, you're letting the size of the box get big. And on yeah. the other hand, you're getting a closer and closer to the edge of, this, of the Stokes wedge in the complex plane. And you have to worry about those two quantities and what is happening as, as one as you're taking the limit of each of them. So you, you do have to be very careful. Okay, that's, that's if you do it uh, PT mode, but if you just try to solve it on the, on the real axis, then yeah. no, but, mm -hmm. but uh, um, yeah, uh, very interesting. Well, obviously the PT problem is very different from, because it has a bottom after all, whereas uh, on the real axis, you never get to fill the bottom, the spectrum will not be bottomless. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense to couple the system to, to external uh, bars or something doesn't make any sense. Only the PT uh, makes sense as, as a quantum system because it has a bottom. Mm -hmm. Philip well, and then just, Ali. Can I, can I respond to that just a second? Oh. I mean, the word bottom is not really appropriate when we're talking about PT because you're in the complex plane. No, no, I meant, bottom, I meant the bottom of the spectrum, bottom of the uh, ground state. Oh, bottom of the spectrum, yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. Sorry, yeah. I have a slightly different comment related to bound states in the continuum. It's something that I once looked at. Um, there's a problem in crystals where you have a pure crystal where all the eigenstates, the phonons and momentum eigenstates, and you put in a defect, a little mm -hmm. bit like you discussed. Mm -hmm. That breaks the translation invariance. Mm -hmm. and what happens is you have to re-diagonalize the whole system. Now, if the defect is lighter, it gets pushed out of the continuum, out of the Debye, um, beyond the Debye frequency, and the momentum that was e to the i kx, k becomes pure imaginary, and it localizes, and that's a bound state. However, if you make the mass greater, then the frequency goes down, because omega squared is k over m, 
and that puts it inside the continuum. And then the, the, energy, the K becomes K1 plus IK2, mm. and that state decays and acquires a width. Mm. So the bound state when it's in the continuum is, is now, it, it now acquires a width and it starts to spread out. So it doesn't, it doesn't stay a sharp, a sharp, a sharp bound, bound state. That's, that was the, that's the, that's the situation that happens in the crystal. Yeah, because it's uh, coupled to the continuum of the phone, of the... Uh, of the phone, yes, yeah. you, have to, have to, you have to re-diagonalize, yes. Yeah. So if you say a bound state in a continuum, the question is, is the, is the bound state coupled to the continuum? Or somehow are they, you, you're, you're trying to say that this, the independent uh, quantities. Yeah, but at um, least in the crystal, everything is controlled. Yeah. Yes, and, and well, because it's, a, I'm telling about it because it's a completely solvable problem. And I solved it. <laughs> anyway. Ali. Uh, yes. <clears throat> you introduced this, uh, what you call scattering states. And all the discussion were about normalizability. What about orthogonality? I mean, how are these Hankel functions are orthogonal? Um, I don't, I don't know actually. Um, I, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I would imagine that they're still orthogonal, but I don't know actually. I mean, another thing. I, the question there is whether you can integrate by parts. Okay, and you can integrate by parts if you don't have boundary terms coming in at infinity. And then that's the, that's the statement of orthogonality. This holds when, when you are sure that the spectrum is real. Like for example, this X cube potential, it's not self-adjoint, the spectrum is the whole complex plane. I mean, you can show that the spectrum for every complex plane, you can have a normalizable Mm -hmm. Eigenfunction. Okay. So. Um, okay. I mean, the, the special states I was talking about uh, would be uh, the bound state energies of mod x cube, let's say, and you know they, they are they are a discrete set. Well, well, they're obviously okay. There, if you take one mod x cube itself, obviously that's an ordinary potential, and uh, and the eigen States will be um, orthogonal, so, you know, orthogonal to each other, but of course we're talking about then the the, the bottomless bit of it on the other side. So I'm not sure if that help is true. By the way, the one thing you know, another thing in ordinary potential is the, is the interlacing of um, of zeros of the wave functions, and I think that still actually holds. Believe it or not, you've got these incredibly oscillating things, and I'm pretty sure they still interlace. <laughs> And of course, in an ordinary potential, you have a finite number of nodes, but this, you've got infinite number of nodes, but still that, that holds, I believe. Um, yeah. that, that, that's an interesting question, Ali. I don't know if, if, the, if you could try and see if um, some of these things are, are orthogonal. Well, I suspect that it may happen. If you put it in finite size, they will not, because precisely the boundary would be the boundary of the box. Then you would have mixing. And so in only in the limit where you remove the size of the box, you will have orthogonal, complete orthogonality. But maybe there is something more. Maybe these are not the true eigenstates, you know, mass uh, energy eigenstates of the system. Maybe it's happening what you happen when you have CP violation, where the CP eigenstates are not the same as the mass eigenstates. Maybe here that you have PT symmetry. I don't know. I'm thinking probably nonsense now, but maybe that's exactly what, uh, what's... Uh, uh, may be happening. In other words, may, they may not be orthogonal, uh, but that orthogonality may mean that there may be something here. Like, like the CP eigenstates are not orthogonal, orthogonal, not orthogonal, right? The K long, K short. Uh, I mean, it's not the K zero, K zero bar, it's the K long, K short, which are the physical eigenstates. So they may be mixing with modes. And when you should have mixing orthogonality is tricky. And certainly you will not have orthogonality if you put it in finite size, in my opinion. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do the calculations and let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Carl said is true, of course, if, but you ignore boundary effects. So the question is how you take the limits, Carl. You know, you have a finite size and you take it afterwards or before, you know, that's, I think it's a matter of ordering of limits probably. 
Right. Definitely. I mean, if you were to do the calculation numerically, that's so right. You, you discretize on a finite lattice. You have to make a decision about what the computer is going to say happens on the last lattice point. You yes. can have the eigenfunction vanish, or you can do something else. You can have its derivative vanish, or, or you know, it. Now, in in on a finite size lattice, there isn't any problem. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. It, it, the question is, as you go off to infinity, have you imposed uh, um, uh, some sort of artificial constraint that remains and ruins your problem? It depends or on not. the continuum limit. You see, the continuum limit is not unique. That's the problem. It, it depends that, on your right. So, so th there's some sensitivity there about how, what it means to go from a finite size mm -hmm. box to an infinite size box. Yes. It's, it's not a trivial question. Okay. It's like a lattice, it's the continuum limit of ordinary lattice gauge field theories. It's not unique. That's you may get problems. If you have anomalies, you have problems. You know, it's an, I mean, it's a lattice, essentially, that's what it is. It's a lattice field theory, right? So. Sure, sure. Hmm. Farhan has a question in the chat. You want to ask it loud, Farhan? You want to unmute yourself? You can ask the question. He says no. He says no. So I, I just read the chat if I interpreted him correctly. Yeah, I read no, it please. out. You can you read the chat? Otherwise, I read it out. So the question is: Is there a classical limit similar to bracket Ehrenfest approach to bracket the equation of motion for the expectation value for x? Um, yeah. So is there a classical limit? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, classically, of course, are, you, are we talking about bottomless potentials? I mean, you know, in a bottomless potential, the, the classical solution is the thing goes off to infinity. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it's a bit tricky. C can I comment on that? I mean, just this is, this is stuff that we've talked about a lot, but, um, uh, you know, if you talk about a classical limit and you're only talking about what happens on the real axis, indeed, what jo what Jonesy said is is true. Um, it it becomes very hard to understand because the particle is go going infinitely fast at infinity. It reaches infinity in finite time, and you can th there's this ambiguous question of if it reaches infinity in finite time t, where is the particle at t plus one? So what we have always done in the past is to, is to extend the real axis into the complex plane and study what's going on classically in the complex plane and then take the limit as you approach the real axis. And then you see a well-defined classical system of paths and so on. And I won't go into that. I won't talk about it. But, but that's, that's what, you know, classically it's, it's, it's not a good idea to keep the problem just on the real axis. Maybe, uh, maybe it's, I don't understand it, but I thought that if any Schrodinger problem, if it's a linear Schrodinger equation, you started with a classical Hamiltonian and quantized it, and expectation values will then obey the classical equations. Now what Carl says is that the solutions to those equations are disastrous, but I think that the equations themselves formally will hold. Well, I wouldn't look at those, the, the, those I wouldn't look at the solution to the classical equations. The classical equations are the classical equations. It doesn't matter whether you write them in terms of complex variables or real variables, but the solutions to those equations are silly on the real axis, but they make perfect sense in the complex plane. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you can study what happens to those solutions as you get closer and closer to the real axis. Anyway, so I believe the, the answer to the question in the chat is that the, the matrix elements of the operators do obey the, do obey the classical equations. Yes, but those matrix elements yeah. don't exist. Yeah. Ah, that's, that's if, I think they do exist if the states are normalizable. No. Well, no, that we just said. No, the that's what Jonesy said. The, the moments of P 
Ah, oh, okay, because how high do we climb in moments? Do we go as high as we squirt? Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Ah, oh, that's interesting. So Erefest theorem fails if the moments, if the p-squared moment is not finite. Mm. If you calculate them on the real axis. I, 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 yes, I understand. If I'm working on the real axis. So actually, it's not a complete theorem. I, I, thought, it was I thought it was generic, but you're, you're absolutely right. Those, the matrix element of p-squared actually has to exist. The point is that the operator must be self-adjoint. Yes. See, like this x cubed potential, mm. you can have normalizable states in which the expectation value is complex. So. Well, uh, I think that going away from real axis, and if you want to approach them afterwards, it's just a way to regularize the problem, right? One way is to stay on the real axis and to uh, introduce a box. Another way is to go away from real axis and approach them. So, okay. I can also tell, well, I don't know. Uh, I see some similarity between uh, the problems that you talked about and the classical problem about falling on the center. If you have the potential uh, minus one over R squared, there are also there are also are solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which are also Bessel functions. Some uh, maybe will be different Bessel functions, but similar. And also there, you can regularize this problem by uh, just cutting the potential, the singularity, introducing some boundary condition, not at zero but close to zero. And then uh, the spectrum becomes discrete, and uh, it uh, depends on uh, the size where you uh, will uh, put this boundary condition. So maybe it's similar to what uh, you would uh, obtain in imposing box conditions for this bottomless potential. I don't know. Okay. Any more comments, questions? If not, you thank you very much again, everybody. Yourself. And I'll tell you about uh, orthogonality. I'll work it out and, and tell you, and you can announce it. <laughs> okay. <laughs>